Um, Dr. Roy is with the uh, business division of uh, Dow uh, Cold Water, uh, Dow Energy and Water Solutions. And he uh, has made important contributions to polyamide reverse osmosis membranes that are used around the world in uh, seawater desalination plants and also has made some important contributions to membrane chemistry and uh, the development of membranes for uh, wastewater treatment. Um, Abhishek uh, received his PhD at Virginia Tech. Uh, he graduated from the Macromolecular Science and Engineering program, so he's part of a very distinguished cadre of polymer scientists that have uh, come out of that program. And we're pleased to have him here. Thank you. Thank you, San Diego and others, for giving us, myself, and Tao the opportunity to be here. And thank you all for taking the time to come out. Uh, particular day is the first day of the snow. Uh, so it's always, always tricky. And I treated myself uh, today with an Uber ride. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take my car and just get an Uber and come here. It worked out pretty nice. So happy to be here, and uh, I think I'll try to have some uh, twist to this uh, presentation is that the way we prepare is to provide some kind of industrial kind of outlook to today's world problem, and at the same time focus on some fundamental issue. But what uh, I really like that uh, to have some kind of like some open dialogue and discussions going forward on this. That's the objective and intent of sharing the work. So what I would do is that. Let's kind of like uh, start the talk with a very personal experience. So this goes back uh, a year in 2016, where as a part of kind of Dower's uh, pro bono initiative and leadership in action program, we as a kind of a team, we went to Philippines. And um, just like many parts of the world, Philippines like India, China, other, the surface water quality over there is, as you could see, uh, it's, it's not great. So it, it receives discharge from various sources of water. That's a very growing problem for the country. And uh, so the point that we wanted to kind of get there is that, you know, the technologies are there to treat this water. But the challenge was to build a consensus. Because there are several socio-political and other factors over there. And as a result, these things are not getting addressed. So well, as a team, what we did is to build a consensus. And what drove today? is the passion, motivation, and inspiration of the people over there that really is taking this walk forward. And that's the story, basically, what I'm going to share today in terms of what we do at Dow is the passion and inspiration coming out. And nothing could be a great slide like this. We all know the water problem that we have and what's uh, going to affect us in the near future. So this is not only a kind of an industrial need, it's a social need, and it's, it's something for the society. So we cannot start this talk without acknowledging the power of collaboration that we have in Dow. So as you could see, there's two distinct units. One is the business, Dow Water and Process Solutions. We call it business R&D. And we have core R&D. So we, really, we understand that in order to bring something new to the market to meet the customer needs, there has to be a blend of fundamental knowledge as well as the application knowledge. So the fundamental knowledge, the core R&D helps us to bring the real characterization tools, understanding the polymer science, and we try to bring the application and merge that too. So we listed the core R&D folks here, but there is a third column over here. That's also we partnered significantly with universities, national labs, and government to bring that fundamental knowledge to ourselves, which is, which is very critical in order to make a progress to the world. So that's kind of the reason why we could advance and we could solve challenges. It's because of the team that we have, and the, and the team need to be interdisciplinary in today's world in order to solve a major challenge like that. So I'm going to talk over today a very focused one area, and then we'll provide very high level overview of various area. One area is that recently we kind of like, we took some steps to make some changes in the polyamide chemistry, to build a platform around the polyamide chemistry. When we say polyamide chemistry, that's the chemistry that goes in the RO membranes, will go into depth. And the reason why we did, because we realized there are three <coughs> critical needs that was pressing. One is the energy water nexus. We all have heard about that. And then there is an increasing availability of fresh water. So the countries like China and India, they need fresh water. And if we think about the market growth, that's like double digit, 20 to 30% growth in the market in area, when the people don't have access to the fresh water. So we need to solve that problem. 
And then this is why things are moving these days, is the reliability and efficiency of the thing. So this is a nice kind of, um, uh, I would say cover page that we borrowed from this article. It's all about what you are really kind of leaving out. So in national parks, when we go, we say that we, we see the posts that don't leave your stress over there. I think that same post is going to come in to water industry. Don't leave those things bad behind it. It's good that we are making good water, but at the same time, you're leaving stuff over there. So that reliability and efficiency is becoming very, very important as we go down the road. So just a kind of like quick um, go out, like we could see the entire spectrum of water purification. It has the mechanical filtration part, and it has the molecular filtration part built into it. So the first two areas where we deal with macromolecules, like the picture we showed, in the, like we saw in the Philippines, that's the surface water, which has many flocculants and macromolecules. So we need to treat those. And there are many technologies which are available. And we just pointed out a few of them based on what we have in our portfolio. But like MABR, MBR, wastewater digestions and everything, very kind of like very close to the civil engineering group over here, the work. That's a very important area that need to be worked. And then when we move out from that mechanical part, more to the molecular ones, where the most of my work talk will be today, is around the nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, where we separate salt and water and try to get the pure water to the world. So those are the two clear buckets that we have. And just kind of like, uh, I try to kind of like always kind of give this share is that filtration is very different. When we talk about molecular filtration versus mechanical filtration, they're different. The mechanical filtration, we care about the size and other things. So that's kind of like the typical we think of and sand filter, just an example. But when it comes to like molecular filtration, which is the reverse osmosis, this is an kind of a, a cartoon of reverse osmosis, and many of you have probably know what the reverse osmosis is. But basically what it does over here, there is a semi-permeable membrane. And we have salt and water. So under the application of the right pressure, the kind of the salt is remained in the concentrate and we get fresh water. So these are the two equations that really governs reverse osmosis. Is one is the water permeability part, that this is the flux part, that is the A value, which is the water permeability. We need more water permeability, of course. And this is the B, which is the salt permeability. That is, we need lower salt permeability to have better quality of the water. But the point that I was I am trying to bring out from this drive is that in energy barrier, so you could see that one has to apply pressure to get water out and also had good quality of salt. So I think this energy barrier is very much dependent on these two part, resistance from the membrane and the thermodynamics. We cannot ignore the thermodynamic part because that's the pressure associated with the mixing of the salt and the water because that cannot be overcome. That's a very important point that, so we, we have to keep the thermodynamics part constant and then work on the membrane part, that how can you make the membrane more and more efficient so that you can allow more water out to it. And uh, nothing could be, so we are all engineers, so we like to see a figure of merit. So the best way to understand that is that to plot this A versus B, that is to see the trade-off where we are. So if we, if we look into that angle, so this is a classical kind of like a figure of merit Plot. People who are familiar with gas separation have seen kind of some upper bound, but this is slightly plotted differently. This is your salt permeability, this is your water permeability. So we need higher water permeability and low salt permeability. That's a very simple. When I joined the company um, back nine years ago, my mentor told me, you know, Vishak, it's a simple thing that you have to do. You have to have the, make a membrane which will have more water coming out and less salt. Coming out. It's very simple. These are the two only things that you need to do. <laughs> Nothing more than that. And it's like, oh, yeah, I thought it's a, it's a simple problem. Then let's go and solve it. But then we started to realize what I, what I got over here. So basically what it is that this is the kind of like the industrial standard graph. What it shows is that here is a point over here. In order to make a, like say, 12650, forget the uh, unit, GPD, it's a very weird unit. Uh, of water, you need 200 PSI. And then the rejection you will get is around 99.5, or the B value is over here. Now you can make that membrane more permeable. That is, you can increase the water permeability, but looks what happens. The salt permeability also goes up. Then the quality of the water is bad now. So you can do more, we can go even higher, but the quality of water is like 99.0. Maybe not acceptable for all the cases. So we can make high water permeable membrane, but we have to realize also there's this trade-off between the salt permeability and the water permeability. So in order to really understood the energy savings, then one has to be in, in, in somewhere over the region where they have the right salt permeability as this membrane, but also have the high water permeability. 
then you can operate, for example, these membranes require 200 PSI to operate. If you have membranes somewhere over here, then you can operate at 125 PSI, but have the same quality of the water. So then you can really make an impact to the energy savings of around 35 to 40%. That's how kind of like the, this curve helps. And when we kind of like talked uh, around this, one thing that was very kind of like uh, uh, interesting that came out from some of the recent work from kind of Elimelech and others is that this thermodynamic factor, you know, like you can keep on increasing this water permeability over and over again. But what it does is that if we look at the, like the kilowatt per meter cube, that is the energy consumption versus the membrane water, pressure, there is a curve of diminishing returns that after a certain water permeability, then it doesn't matter how much the membrane water permeability is, you will face problems like system uh, loss, like loss due to fouling and everything, which will diminish your return. So you cannot get much energy benefit out of it. So there is a sweet spot where you can get the best energy benefit and the chemical savings. And one of the, by doing those analysis and asking the customers, we realized that if we have a target somewhere over here, that would give us the best energy savings as well as return the best quality of the water. So this is something like kind of drove by the market and the industrial need and also supported by some of the thermodynamic work. So now the cha challenge is how to get there. So this is where I would say that like science can help because this was a problem that is very difficult to really solve. And uh, fortunately, Dow has a very strong innovation strategy working with universities and others which helps us to understand the fundamentals. So one thing we, we try to do is that let's go back to the real main problem. Now I'm going to get into what reverse osmosis membrane looks like. So for example, uh, for a reverse osmosis, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at the membrane. It is a three layer component. So one layer is the polyethylene terephthalate. That's your kind of like a support. And on the top of the polyethylene terephthalate, you put polysulfone, which is like a very like a spongy material, which is like almost like a UF membrane. And the, and the purpose of the polysulfone is that it allows the polyamide membrane to form. So for example, we have the PET polysulfone, and then we impregnate this polysulfone with a monomer we call MPD, uh, metabolic diamine, and it reacts with the monomer called TMC. These are three functional groups, and it forms this structure. So this is a nanoscale. It is functionalized because we have a lot of functionalization. It is a cross link and the reaction time is three to five seconds. What else you want? This is one of the most complex structure that I think that we have, and it's been, it was invented 30 years ago, and little has been known on this structure. For the last 30 years, we're dealing with this membrane, which is sitting kind of under the sink in many of our houses. I have one of these like RO unit in my house. So this is, this is like the ch challenge, is that it's very highly cross-link nanoscale morphology. It's very difficult to understand what's, what's over there, and that prevents like the, the, that, that doesn't accelerate the innovation over here. So for example, if we look at like the um, trade uh, metrics, like it takes decades to make the next big, big change because to increase a factor of two of water permeability, it's almost like 10 or 15 years before that happens. And the challenge has been always this absence of fundamental structure property relationships because we don't know what is the structure property for this membrane over here. And that's the reason why we cannot progress in this area. So what we decided from our company, let's, let's build capabilities to understand this structure. So, and when we talk about building capabilities, we wanted to consider these five different um, metrics for polymer science. Anyone with a polymer, they know that if one can change one of these metrics, they can change the properties of the membrane. So that was our hypothesis. And then uh, we are industry, so we are driven by customer requirement. If there is no strong customer pool, then the research is hard to move that research towards that direction. So the customer pool over there was definitely in, in various sectors like power, chemicals, and, and the steel iron industry. They need to solve the water energy nexus, that they need to improve the energy efficiency by 30% and also 40% less salt passage. In the residential sector, people needed 30% more water. And in the reliability and efficiency sector, people needed 30% sustained energy savings. So we decided maybe we start playing with the structure broad relationship and see what we can do. Can we change the polymer structure in a way that it will change the trade off between water and salt? First thing we wanted to do is to that build the capabilities. 
So I will not go into depth, but there are a lot of tools that are available, and we need to ask the, find the right tools to find the right properties. So this was a mission for almost four or five years. And we collaborated with NIST National Labs. We collaborated with our analytical science, collaborated with many universities like Penn State and others to help us to build this tool and start studying this material. What we realized after building this tool, and I will not go in depth, but the message was that we tried to measure many parameters, like what is the carboxylic content, what is the monomer ratio, what is the cross-linking, and all these things. What we found is that no matter whether we change the TMC concentration, that is the monomer concentration or recipe variables, we are locked in a very narrow compositional zone. That, that membrane, irrespective of who is making, we are making, or our competitors are making for the last 30 years, same very similar composition. So people haven't even, we didn't have them in the flexibility of just varying the composition, which is the first thing that one does in polymer science. So this was an eye opening that we couldn't, that we are locked in that chemical composition regime. So the, of course, then it's a, now it becomes kind of more comfortable from a polymer science standpoint. Let's try to expand those. And uh, one can have various strategies to do that, but there are four strategies that exist today in today's literature, and we tried all of the, all the four to try to get a hold of it. One is that as the polymerization is happening, we can add additives, various types of additives in the water phase or in the organic phase to change the polymerization network. We can play with the classical polymer, uh, polymer chemistry's favorite thing is alternate monomers. We can add different monomers with different structures over here and change the polymer composition. We can put a coating on the top of the membrane because that's another way we can change the fouling and other things. We can even do end cap modification that we can take the polymer and post modify it over here. So we started doing all this thing. The first approach that we took was a, we call it a tar <coughs> polymer approach. That is, we started adding different monomers. Now each of these monomers is almost a PhD thesis for anyone to go over. And we'll not go into details, but I wanted to show is that this level of detailed different monomer structures helped us to build a database of what we call structure power relationships. And that helped us to guide to the innovations. So for example, uh, if we, um, and um, alternative monomer, which instead of have three, three COCL group, now have two COCL group. Then what you can do is that you can change the ratio of the amine to the, carbo to the COCL moieties. So you could see earlier the ratio was always 1.7. For any product that, we, that people have made in the last 30 years, we had a ratio of 1.7. Now we can move, that is you can change the polymer topology and the structure, we can move from 1.7 to way over here. So that's a definitely a compositional change that is happening. The other thing, you can have a monomer with a carboxylic group over here. So earlier, let's say in the last 20 years, we were locked kind of more in this region, X, very, very little change in the carboxylic content. But with that monomer, now you can increase the carboxylic content up to 6X. So you're definitely now changing the chemical composition of the polymer as we speak. And what it does is that, just look about the properties. We talk about hydrophobic polymers, hydrophilic polymers. RO membranes are known as hydrophobic. But if you apply the right monomer, you can have that polyamide swell up to as high as 60%. So it's becoming very close to an hydrophilic. Now I'm not saying the hydrophilic polymers are, is the way to go, or this is what we're doing, but this gives us the breadth of expanding all the different compositions. And I think one thing that we, sh that is, we should appreciate and over here is the development of these techniques. You know, the, the way we are measuring the carboxylic group and the way we are measuring the hydrophilic, these techniques are not really accessible in the literature. So we, we, we took the help of NIST and other, Penn States and other, to help us to develop this technique for us, and then we can start measuring all this property. So that's why the power of collaboration really came, came into place, and this is something DAO as a whole have not all, have not have the, all the tools, but we look forward to universities to help us in these regions. So similarly, um, going from the carboxylic, uh, the hydrophilic, the one property that people who are familiar with thermoset polymers, that is the polymer which cross-links, they know that if one can change the cross-linking density, it can change wonder to the polymer properties. So by applying the right monomer uh, type, I, we, we, we were able to move from the cross-linking density way up to almost a non-cross-link polyamide membrane. So that's again opened up a wide variation of things. So mechanical properties, there's something we measure, I think, in civil engineering and thing. What's the mechanical properties of the membrane? This was very difficult thing to measure. 
And I think the NIST group, they, they developed a technique called the surface wrinkling technique, which allows us to measure the mechanical property of ultra-thin nanoscale membranes. And we applied that technique to start measuring the mechanical property. So if you can reduce the cross-linking density, you could really reduce, start to make changes in the modulus of the membrane and the toughness of the membrane. So all this, what it does is that it allowed us to build a database of different structures and composition. And now we wanted to see that what affects the membrane salt and flux, which monomer you should put in to make the change to the membrane flux and everything. And we have a publication coming up where I think we are now going to publish all the detailed monomer structure and how that is imp impacting the protein. So one example I want to show is that effect of the carboxylic group. For example, if you have X carboxylic group and you start increasing the carboxylic or the charge of the membrane, you could have a dramatic influence on the salt passes. So this is the chloride salt passes. You could have almost 40 to 50 percent decrease in the salt passes just by adding the right amount of carboxylic group in the membrane. So you have to balance the network structure and the carboxylic group in a way that you can make that change. So that was a major change, I would say, just by taking out polymer and reducing 40 to 50 percent of your salt passes without changing the flux. That made a lot of difference. So when we looked into those polymers that we were making, this is a kind of a trade-off curve that was kind of published in the JMS by Freeman's group. And it compares all the different kind of uh, membranes that are available in the market. And when we compare the new, mem new type of membranes we are making, we could see that positioned quite differently than the existing trade-off. And it makes sense because the existing trade-off is built on a polymer which where the composition and structure has not been changed for the last several years. Now, once you start changing those composition and structure, you would be in a different trade-off curve. And that's what the trade-off curves are appearing. So this helped us to kind of like uh, come close or, or get close to the target that an industry was looking over. And I think it has been almost five years that this product is in the market. We call it kind of eco family of product. It, has, it is addressing a lot of energy water nexus issues and people can really now benefit out of those energy savings that we have in the market. So moving forward, uh, we have done um, enough research to now build several generations of the membrane. And what we have realized over here is that we have been able to decrease the energy consumption way from 200 PSI, so this is like 100 PSI, over 65%. And if we look into the thermodynamic graph that we have, this is the point where it sits. So we are now in the range of diminishing returns that any further increase in the water permeability, particularly for this application, is not helping us to get any, any, any further energy savings over here. But that's the energy water nexus. But we'll say that how the water permeability membranes can help you in other areas. So for example, the second one topic is trust for fresh water. And as I say, I, I'm feeling thirsty, so I to get some water. <laughs> I don't know whether it's RO water or no, probably it's RO water. So anyway, so this is the case from, where, from the country that I come in India. I think there is a significant challenge with getting drinking water. And in China, maybe there, there is all the same challenge. But there is another challenge that associated with it. Maybe you can provide drinking water by putting RO units in your house. But if you think about the population density, the footprint of people's apartments or houses, even we call houses, it's very, very challenging. They're trying to squeeze everything together. Now with a auto unit, with a big tank, if you want to put all those things in the kitchen, we need a kitchen like what we have in US. And that kitchen is almost like the size of an apartment in total in China. So I think we need to work together. There is a strong need to remove that tank. And the, one of the ways that could be done, uh, I'll just keep this slide because it talks about the same thing I was talking, is that Increasing that water permeability. Increase as much as high possible as you can to it. And then if you have that high permeability, then you don't have to store the water in the tank. You can get instant supply of water without the tank. So this really helped us to develop products. And now it's a very popular product in those countries. We call it tankless product. So you just buy a very small unit. You put it in. There is no tank. It needs a pump to get the energy. But it provides water and significantly reduces the footprint cost. Now, what is the challenge that is happening now in the industrial area? And I talked with, I realized there are people over here with a lot of mechanical engineering background, is that 
When we drink one glass of water, we throw out three glasses of water in residential sector. That is a huge loss of water. And that's because the recovery for the water is 25%. We need to have the recovery even close to 75%. And when we talk about recovery, what matters is the hydrodynamics on the membrane surface. So innovation in the spacer design, in the RO membrane, which allows a better uh, hydrodynamics, so that will prevent scale formation, and that will allow high recovery to happen. So that's a very pressing need. When if we have to do something today to launch a product, that's the high recovery product. That getting that 25% to 75%, and the fundamentals are totally I mean, it's missing. That what causes scaling on the membrane surface? That's a great topic to really discuss and, and debate. Because if we could understand the scaling, we can solve many things. We can save those three glasses of water that we are throwing out. So I'll just go kind of like that's the tank I was talking about. That eliminating that this tank over here is great, and that's what we are kind of working and get there. So the next topic that I'm going to go and now it's going to move more towards very general than what are current areas that industries and the world is moving. So this is one very strong topic: is reliability and efficiency. So leaving that salt behind is is, is this big thing, and what we mean by that um, is what we called. Our industrial customers are squeezed by two ends. So if this is on my hand, this is the other hand. Over here, what I have is that I'm getting like all different sources of water, sea water, brackish water, and inland water. And those water are not getting better and better. They are getting worse and worse. So I have to deal with, first of all, a very bad quality of water. And then what I'm saying is that if my company is in China, and if my company is in India or other, then I'm regulated by what I can throw out. So the government is putting a lot of pressure that you cannot throw out what you were doing earlier. So they are challenged by both of the two ends, to deal with the uh, not so good quality of water coming in, and then what you can throw. So we're going to squeeze over here. And one of the areas that is preventing is the fouling to improve area, yeah, because the membranes foul significantly, auto membranes. That is no question. Even today, I cannot, or anyone cannot claim that we made the best perfect membrane which will not foul in our current industry. And, and there is a lot of reason why membrane falls. And what we are learning is that this plays a huge role, that these spacers. The spacers are one which kind of are placed on the membrane to allow better concentration, polarization, mixing, and then that was a classical thought. Now we are realizing is that we are creating a lot of dead spots over here, as you could see. And these dead spots are allowing the box to grow on the, mers on the spacers. So if by so what we have done is that we applied CFD and other things to understand like how you can optimize those spacers to eliminate the dead spots. But this is just a kind of I would just step towards it, but better hydrodynamic understanding is needed to control and mitigate the fouling from this. So we all know the chemistry part, so I'm not going to go over the chemistry of the fouling, but the spacer aspect is very important. That uh, we believe that innovation in this spacer area may be a total and completely new design of how our membrane could be put into it that can address this issue. And this issue is probably one of the most strongest issue we got could be seen from this graph. Is, um, it's a plot of what we called, uh, I'm coming from industry again, that's why our y-axis um, has start to become like a cost of water recovery. It's a dollar sign is always there. That's, the, that's one of the metric. So what it says is that, let's say I'm, I'm running an industry, okay, and I, I have to discharge. And uh, I, I start discharging over here. Earlier, we, we could discharge uh, up to a 70% water recovery, 30% could be discharged. But now, uh, uh, regulations in China and India, they are saying that you need to go to 100%, that is zero liquid discharge. And there is a, like, a very strong curve, like this curve is actually right over here. So there is a lot of energy cost that one has to pay in order to go to ZLT. So we can design specialty down, like we say, we're designing MLD concept, where we are using uh, different types of membrane to bring the energy costs down. But there is even a strong, like you see over here, this is the thermal. That is why people currently are using what you call evaporators to get the water out. So there is a strong like, need of innovation in this area, which can decrease this cost down significantly and make an improvement. So all the different techniques that we hear about electro deionization, forward osmosis, and all different techniques, this has very nice kind of niche application in those areas to get the cost up down. And frankly, I mean, we saw the energy and water nexus. We are almost there. But this is an area which has been untouched. And this is what is going to go bigger and bigger as we, as we go forward. So I would really kind of encourage kind of what we have to think in this area, the minimal liquid discharge, ZLD area, what could be done to bring the cost down. So basically what the goal that we are shooting and the industry and the society is going to is to 
finite water supply that is need to squeeze more from every drop of water we make. That's the goal and the vision that the people are thinking and going forward. Now I'm going to guide a um, few slides around uh, next generation chemistries and applications which can help to get there and open up new applications for membranes. So uh, we just kind of like, uh, uh, we started kind of actively research, kind of looking into this area of novel materials which are coming out, like people working with the graphenes, aquaporins, blockopolymers. We, the blockopolymer is a term which we, I think we don't have to explain in University of Minnesota, that term, so what blockopolymer means. But it's been tremendous work that is happening in this area. And there are many new applications that are coming out which we think that are going to be beneficial from these materials. And we just wrote a kind of review article on this from an industrial perspective, what we think about this material. So for example, like in the graphene, I think over here, kind of there's a lot of work happening in the graphene area. And this kind of slides, I'll not go into there, but captures the different phases that the graphene work. But some of the functionalization of the membrane with the graphene, that has shown a lot of promise. And I think the area that I will point out from an industry perspective, perspective, this is, this is what we need, what I think we think we need is the kind of like defect management and the assessment of the manufacturing of the graphene and the graphene oxide. So that's an area if, if, if thing as we move forward, if this moves progressing, there is a lot of merit in going forward with the graphene. Similarly with the block of polymer part, there's been a lot of great work happened in the University of Minnesota. This is, an, this is a great template for addressing very special applications that I will be sharing in the few in the later slides which can have been able to the block of polymer approach and I think we are getting very close with this material. There are a lot of startup companies are available. I think probably this is the closest in compared to graphene and aquaporin that we have in terms of because when we look at there is a scalability that has been getting addressed. We can now make membranes with the right polymer in the size that could be put into the application field. So this is probably the clue strongest out there and it has a lot of special applications. So I would encourage, I mean this paper, we try to put all the different metrics and what is needed. Similarly with the aquaporins, some, a lot of work and there's a new company that also recently kind of launched based on these aquaporin membranes. So these are the three main uh, kind of like classified besides the carbon nanotubes where people are researching to make the next breakthrough. And I'm going to explain like kind of some of the areas where um, beyond water purification, uh, the applications are emerging and these materials can have a strong role in these areas. So we talked about quite a bit on reverse osmosis and NF. But there are a lot of other areas where these days the membranes are being needed. For example, if you think of dairy application, that's the strongest uh, application sector in uh, Europe. Um, China is importing um, <laughs> baby foods from Europe and all these things so the, and, uh, so the market is growing. The challenge with the dairy industry is that if they use the current RO membranes, they are cleaning it every day. Because of all these macromolecules which are getting deposited on the membrane surface, they, are, they have to clean every day. And these are polymers, they have a life. I mean, if you clean it every day, they're not going to be stable for that. So I think there's a strong need of innovation in that area, high productivity, better materials, which could be less clean and area. Because this, this industry is growing very rapidly, the dairy sector. Similarly, in the uh, solvent stable NF area because solvent processing in bio, bio and other thing is an important strong advice and current polyamide membranes are not stable and because support is not stable in the area. So new membranes like Professor Livingstone's and others they are developing and all this graphene oxide, lockopolymer and those have a strong need in the solvent separation, acid recovery <coughs> and other areas. So those could be really a nice application. The next one is the application of nanofiltration membrane in sweetener and others. So separation of glucose and sucrose of uh, different area, acid recovery. So all these nanofiltrations are getting used in those areas. Those are very niche area, but one good thing about this is that those are very highly attractive area. So for new chemistries like block copolymers, graphene, aquaporin, I think these are the great some of the places where they will, the initial kind of like road to the manufacturing could be paid off if we participate into those areas. So with that, I think I'll try to kind of like put a uh, summary slide around the innovation needs that we're seeing. I think we talked about the fouling control and mitigation. That's going to be, that's the number one in terms of the ZLD part that we are sending. Understanding the 3D structure, we, we have done a good portion to get to that point, but there is many things in that polyamide matrix that need to be understood like the free volume and other things, which can have a many bigger change down in the road. We don't know yet. 
novel reliable membrane chlorine resistant. The value proportion for chlorine resistant is changing now because if we have a chlorine resistant membranes, then one can add chlorine to the feed and that can eliminate the bifouling. So that's a one way to mitigate fouling. So there is a strong need from that angle too. And then I think the last but the most strongest is the growing increasing discharge requirements. That is becoming the strong. People are moving towards zero discharge and I think everybody's working to get there. So with that being said, I think I'm going to go back to that first uh, slide that I said, I, I showed about the work with the Philippines. And I'm going to show the passion for the uh, graduate students who were working in that project, how passionate they were. They built this video with one day of work. And I'm going to leave the group with this video just to see that how, how people think about their society and about their water quality over there. So hope I hope this plays. We were there kind of in, in the trend, right on the creek. And this is the wild there sampling the water from the creek taking it to people and water. And you can see how, how this guy was embracing the safety. That's another kind of key thing that we really want to pass on. Fortunately, this work has been this year, been a finalist for the ICAMI award, which is going to happen next year. So they've got a lot of kind of like, so hopefully this will be not only limited to Philippines, we'll be able to take this work and move it forward to other parts. But the key thing is that technology is probably on this area there, but it's building the consensus is very important. That the role of the society in water purification, we cannot ignore that. Thank you. With that, this is open for us. Hi, so uh, if any questions for Abhishek, please wait to be given the uh, microphone. This is being recorded. Hi, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. But I, I also come from outside the field, so a sure. lot of the stuff where you said we all know, I mm -hmm. don't know. So, <laughs> so uh, forgive me, but I think that the question that I ask is a fairly naive one, mm -hmm. but it has to do with the fouling of the filters. And I'm wondering if you could describe um, maybe briefly what is the primary um, fouler or what are the dominant foulers? Is it sure. more like a microbial sort of thing or is, is it fine particulates? And then along those lines, what are at least the traditional ways of cleaning off the filters? Very good question. I think uh, so if we look at the fouling, it's very complex because the three types of, I mean, if we categorize fouling, the three types. One is your biological, which is maybe 50% of the case is biological fouling. <coughs> then you have the organic foulings, surfactant, and all those things that comes from semiconductor and other industries. And then your third is the particulate, silica and all those kind of things. So uh, water could have a mix of all those three. So it's very difficult to design one membrane that would fit all the needs. And it very much depends on that particular application type of where, where we are putting the membrane over there. And, uh, and typically how people have mitigated on the membrane surface, I mentioned the word cleaning. And what that means is that they will clean it at a very high pH initially. Uh, and then uh, like pH 11 or pH 12. And then that would mostly to degrade the bugs and everything on the surface. And then they will clean at a very low pH, like pH 2 or 1, to get the inorganic spurt things out. So that's the cleaning process. But think about the pH ranges. And it's like an hour treatment, and sometimes temperature goes up. That's very harsh for the membrane. And I talked about the dairy one, which if they do every day, the membrane lifetime is three years, probably. Three months, probably, instead of five years. 
And, and then at the very end, you said this is something that you, you sort of suggested there was a, solu a solution that was up and coming for more efficient, maybe prevention of membrane fouling. Could you repeat that again? I didn't quite yeah, catch that. Yeah, that pro um, probably mentioned about the recovery, recovery part. Yeah, so we, we worked on that spacer kind of like um, configuration. We did research, and that is helping us to uh, improve the recovery from 25% to 50%. So there is some new products that came out in the residential sector with high recovery, but not done fully. You know, 50% we need to go to as high as possible. <coughs> and that type of research in the spacer area is very encouraged to, to see that how we can mitigate or improve the recovery. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I wanted to bring in both the chemistry perspective and the mechanical kind of engineering perspective. Because these are all tied together. It's not only the chemistry that can solve. So I'm wondering about your 100% passage of water and zero waste. You are filtering material from the water. And so I'm wondering what that, that waste material looks like if you have 100% water passage. And does that, um, uh, in, does that increase the uh, rate of fouling? Yes, that is, that is one of the, so when you looked at the curve of the recovery versus the cost of, the reason why that area is getting very difficult to treat is because the concentrate that now you're dealing with is, has more fallen. And that's causing, that, that's why the membrane could be used up to a certain point. After that, the fouling becomes so severe that you cannot use the membrane anymore. So that's, the, that's why this controlling that fouling, knowing how to control the fouling, that might allow you to push uh, the membrane use maybe from 85% to all up to 95%. Even that 10% savings is enormous savings in the cost of the whole process. So your waste product is still a liquid, it's not a solid? At the end, when it gets to zero liquid, then zero liquid, then it's, it's a solid. It's a solid, which, it, which is entirely... Brine. Yeah, it's yeah. brine. Which is 100% fouling. It's 100%, uh, it has a lot of stuff over there in, in, in terms of... And, and the way that rightly they're doing is that, you know, like you can, uh, you can use different membranes, for example, selective membranes. That's an area I didn't talk about in the zero liquid discharge, where you could have the salt actually go through your membrane and the foulens go in the other direction. So you can start purifying the salt through that process. And then your concentrate is like you have a salt rich concentrate and then you have foulens area. So that's how you can separate the foulens from the salt and you can use that salt back for your other applications like ion exchange and everything. So getting value out of what you are discharging by selective membranes. And what kind of care do these membranes need? And if you're implementing them in communities, is that something they can do on their own or do they need some sort of professional? Yes, they have, we have guidance. Uh, I mean, the industry ma ma manual that this is how you would put it. But that's a very good point because so the strategy of like baking product, I mean, and then going, going to the strategy of like, you know, like I'm going to the customer and asking what's your problem. Let me solve that problem for you. So that's why the service part becomes so important. Many companies are providing service to take care of the plants and everything. But there is a general guide, guideline. This is how one should protect the membrane or should clean the membrane. But that service component is going to be very important down the road. Uh, I have a question on the follow-up yeah. on the previous one. Sure. So what happens with that minimum liquid discharge? Is it like what, uh, is it treated more or what, what is happening I mean, currently? Current, current will be, it will be I mean, like landfill probably. So I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a concern. So that's why we are promoting that if we are kind of have selective membranes, then it, you know, actually you can purify that salt and instead of like you know you can use that salt for other applications like sometimes the pure brine is needed for certain things and exchange reasons and everything you can move that brine over there that will minimize your what you are discharging to the nature and that's why this national park example I, it stayed with me like when you visit a national park don't leave your trace behind and, and that is that is our kind of like we'll, we'll come into it uh, so I wanted to ask you about the aquaporins. Are okay. those uh, biologically synthesized, or are those synthesized like in a reactor and then self-assembled? So the literature, if you look into the literature, I think the initial the aquaporin came out from the biological work. I mean, it's a protein, you know, that, that's kind of like people. But some of the work that Manish Kumar's uh, lab and others in, I think in France, I forgot his name has done, is that they've been able to synthesize those. Uh, 
similar ones with a similar water diffusion rate. I think that helps to kind of increase the ability for to make it on a larger scale and maybe those are more, slightly more stable down the road. But, it, but the concept derived from the nature of biological proteins. Any other questions? Um, with respect to the work you did on increasing the carboxylic acid func uh, functional groups in mm -hmm. the uh, in the membrane, mm -hmm. you talked about that improving the um, uh, water flux and the salt. Uh, in improving the salt passage of the membrane. Uh, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how did that impact uh, fouling? It's or a good question. So if you have uh, a negatively charged membrane, let's say the sur surface is negatively charged, depends what are what what is your fouling. If it's a negatively charged fouling, which is Typically, the most of the case, 80 to 90 percent negatively charged surfactants that we have, that will have an impact on mitigating the fouling. If you have a cationic, then it depends on the situation what will happen. But given, and it all depends on the surface charge concentration of the membrane. And, and one of the nice things is that the salt rejection is more dependent on your bulk morphology. What is your in charge inside the membrane? What's your accessible charge? Where a fouling is more dependent on your surface charge. So, you, so it's like done on an exclusion. Done on an exclusion. Correct. Okay. So, so the uh, increasing the so if I understand correctly, then mm -hmm. increasing the carboxylic functional group not only improved salt rejection, but it also it also will help with your with your fouling, fouling. for cool. for anionic best form. Cool. That's why fouling is so com complicated. Going to your point, I mean, it's 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 hard to find an universal solution. That's why sometimes the chlorine resistant membranes may have like, uh, like, like if we have blockopolymer and other types which are stable to chlorine, you can add chlorine to the water and you can mitigate fouling right away. And that's a, like a huge benefit to the world. So I mean, that's why I'm trying to bring out like what are the areas where new membranes have potential and areas where you can think of like doing studies. So I'll, I'll take a question. Sure. Uh, when you were investigating the effect of different monomer chemistries, yeah. flexibilities, you, when you change the recipe, you're changing multiple things at the same yes. time, the diffusivity, yes. the kinetics. How are you? I wondered if you could say a few words on how you study this systematically. I think that's, um, that, that's a benefit goes uh, to the structure of the monomers. Mm -hmm. So the way you design the monomers is that in one way you can have monomers where you are maybe changing the cross-linking density without changing the functionality. Mm -hmm. Where you can have keep the cross-linking density same and you change the functionality. Mm -hmm. And then you start kind of like understanding the effect of the two, decouple them separately and then see the effect. But can you really do that considering that you're changing, these are interfacial yes, polymerization with the, with membranes, the right, right? With the right monomers, you can, you, can. you can. That is the, I think the key part over here is that the rate of uh, reactivity between the TMC and that monomer. If you can control that, the reason why this hasn't been that successful earlier is, is the rate of reactivity between the two. Mm -hmm. It's a classical R1, R2 in free radical polymerization, but this is step growth. So this is why if you can control both of the two properly, then you can have an homogeneous polymer network, and then you start to see the effect of this one over. Okay, there's one more question. In some of this work we are publishing uh, will be in a, in a journal soon that will uh, allow us to. The goal is that will that bring uh, then that might help to, to bring more discussions on the table. Yeah, please. So if I understood you correctly, you st it, it, one of the things you said was a possible solution, at least in some cases, is to have sort of multiple stage filters. Um, so what you, you sort of have a brine rich area or salt rich area, and then maybe clarify the rest of it a little bit farther down or something like that. Does that increase time or what, are, you know, or is that sort of a common solution? Yeah, so the, um, I think in the slide that, you know, I probably have, I mean, well, maybe I'll just, is that like, saw that the recovery versus the cost metric slide. Mm -hmm. Over there, mm -hmm. I think, as I said, up to seven, after 70 percent, it gets challenging to do it. Mm -hmm. So instead of RO membrane, you can use selective membranes, mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. instead of rejecting the salt, you allow the salt to go through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thereby, through that process, what it does is that the energy, energy associated to reduce, to kind of get to ZLD decreases significantly. Mm -hmm. And like some of the industries in India, textile industries and others, 
And we, we just launched a series of family of products called Forty Life that is designed to, to do those spatial rejections at those level and bring down that cost significantly. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? All right, let's thank Abhishek one more time.